see you this morning at one. Uh, as you will soon find out, um, one of the kind of contributions that were brought this morning was particularly relevant to what I want to speak about. Um, but we will get cross, get to that get to that bridge when we cross it. Something like that. <laughs> cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, uh, we are in the last of our kind of three-part mini-series on 4G Church, um, and uh, Aaron and Andy have already spoken to us uh, on this series. This morning, uh, the, the Jew that I want to look at is Gather. Gather. Uh, hopefully, it'll come up behind me quite soon. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I just wanted to ask the question, why, why Gather? There we go. Uh, why gather? So why gather in terms of why do we choose that as one of these kind of three things to talk about, one of these three kind of Gs to, to highlight in this series? But also, why, why do we gather as a church? Uh, for what purpose? Do we even need to? Uh, you, if you skip on to the next one, and then on again. So why gather? Go to the cartoon below. Uh, yeah, a load of people leaving church saying, we're leaving because we do not like the way things are done. And then a load of people arriving at church saying, we're arriving because we do not like the way things are done elsewhere. Um, I found this image this week on Google um, as I searched for individualistic. Um, and I wasn't even searching for church-related images. This is just something that came up. Clearly, kind of many, of, many of us recognize this scene, which is why it's kind of mildly amusing. It's not hilarious um, <laughs> to us, uh, which, which means that this kind of scenario, I suppose, this situation is fairly commonplace. But is it a healthy understanding of the church, uh, of church? Sometimes it feels like maybe it would be easier uh, just to, for us to be the only person in the church, if we, we, were, we were all kind of all attending a church of one, um, for us to decide kind of what our time of worshiping would look like, how long we have time of worship for, how long there would be a talk for, uh, to sing the songs that we enjoy and not the ones that, that we don't, to study the Bible in the way that we want to, maybe looking particularly at like books of the Bible that we really enjoy, to get involved in community or outreach or overseas project that we really care about um, and maybe not ones that we're not that bothered about, uh, not to disagree agree or fall out with or get frustrated by other church members or leaders or just the way things are done. Um, so why don't we just uh, meet with God in our own way? Why do we gather? What is the value of church? I spoke to a couple very recently for whom the kind of scenario that I just talked about is actually uh, kind of what they've decided to do. Um, <laughs> they've decided that they are fed up with church, they don't like the way things are done, uh, they don't like, they're frustrated with the people and their attitudes and their beliefs, and they've decided that they're going to just do church by themselves on a Sunday morning in a coffee shop um, and try and just engage people and talk to people about Jesus. They're doing church just as a couple. To me, that is incredibly sad and a misunderstanding of what church is and our place in it. Uh, and so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want us to consider three commonly asked questions, questions that we ask ourselves, maybe questions that we ask one another, um, and yeah, maybe even questions that we ask regularly, uh, and they are these three questions. Who am I? What should I do with my life? And am I reaching my potential? These questions are not necessarily bad questions to ask, but I want us to look at each of them in turn and to propose a different way of asking these questions, these three questions, to uh, ourselves. Today's sermon is something that I kind of feel God's been impressing on my heart for quite a while to talk about. Um, it's something that I shared with Andy and Aaron a, a while back, and then uh, at West Point, many of you were there, and uh, if you watched kind of the West Point highlights video, many of you will have seen people sharing that their highlight was um, Andrew Wilson's talk on uh, individualitis. Uh, so he talked about, he, he talked from the passage in Nehemiah and was talking about how the people all played their part in building uh, a wall. And... Uh, yeah, basically what he said was exactly what I've been feeling for a long time, and so I'm probably going to be borrowing quite heavily from what he talked about, because he put it into words probably more articulately than I could. But um, yeah, it's just, just uh, that, is, that is what I want to speak to you about this morning. And so uh, the first question I want to look at is, is who am I? And 
again, borrowing the word that Andrew Wilson used, I want to look at the term individualitis, which is on the next slide. Uh, there we go. I've, I felt like a kind of a biohazard symbol. It's the disease of individualitis. Um, and if it had like a symbol, it would probably be something like this, uh, just a one person on the sea field by themselves. Um, <laughs> individualitis is a disease in our culture, in our society. Uh, the idea that my life is solely my responsibility, that I am the center of my universe. We in the West seem to have it worse than, uh, the, than kind of the, the, the sort of other parts of the world. And, and actually, there is research to suggest that in the UK, we suffer with this disease more, more acutely than anywhere else in the world. It, if you're young or successful, uh, then you're likely to suffer with this even more than kind of an older generation, maybe, or, the, or less rich, uh, because you haven't yet learned otherwise, or because your circumstances or context actually reinforce that belief that everything revolves around you. Here are some questions that may help you to think a bit more about whether you suffer with individualitis. Again, I've borrowed these, but I feel like they're helpful questions for us to consider. Uh, when we think about scripture or the Bible, we, do we think, uh, is this for me? Uh, in my reading, is it God's revelation of himself in scripture to me, to be read by myself, or is it corporate? Is it for us, for his people, for his church? When we think about church, do we think about it as being optional or non-essential, like the couple I talked about before, or is it the purpose of the gospel? If you take on spiritual gifts, is I've got this gift, how is the church going to use my gift, rather than the church has this need, how can I serve that need? then that's a sign of individualitis. When I was growing up, one of the things that my mum used to say regularly to me, um, when I was being selfish usually, was, the world doesn't revolve around you, Daniel. Um, and it was honestly one of the best lessons that I've learned in my life. Well, it might, may sound kind of harsh in some respects, or it's, it's certainly not a, the world is your oyster, uh, go for it. It's actually quite liberating. It's quite uh, liberating to fundamentally know that the world does not depend on us. It's my, that my place in human history is not so cataclysmically significant that if I get a th single thing wrong, it will spell disaster for the whole of humankind. Um, I, I'm not ignoring the role of significant individuals in our world. Clearly, there are a number of people whose choices and whose actions do have significant impact on others and on the world around. But... Uh, and also, yeah, in the Bible too, there are obviously a number of individuals who are highlighted, people uh, of great faith. The Bible does talk a lot about significant individuals, but the main narrative of the Bible is primarily about Jesus and God's people, plural. We have a corporate identity, uh, one that was talked about by Terry, which uh, I'm going to be reading from the same verses that he just read. Um, and, yeah, last week, we, we talked about it. A number of the contributions last week talked about this community, this uh, body of people. Uh, we had words that, that talked about us being a community of believers. Gal shared about that, about us being an army, the army of God. Uh, Scott shared about that. And then as, as a family. And all of these images are uh, as corporately, as, as a people, are Identity. We need to have a mindset, a mindset of our identity as being corporate, as being a part of this people of God. So back to our first question that I want us to consider. Rather than asking, who am I? I want to propose that a better question that we can ask ourselves is, who are we? Uh, and the answer to that question comes loud and clear in 1 Peter chapter 2, which has already been read this morning, but I'm going to read it again. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The question is, who are we? It is answered in stark terms in verse 10 of the, these verses. Either you are a part of God's people, either you are a part of this people, or you are not a people at all. In light of eternity, that's the only thing that matters. Are you a part of this people, God's people, 
or are you not a people? It doesn't matter if you're British, if you're Conservative, if you're an Arsenal supporter, if you're a Coldplay fan, if you're a member of Mensa, it doesn't matter if you're a dog lover or a cat lover, it doesn't matter what group of people you associate yourself with or you feel a part of or feel connected with, those groups of people, whilst uh, they may be of seeming importance to us now, are simply summed up in this passage as not a people. Either you have received mercy and are a people for his own possession, or you are not a people. What else does the Bible say about who we are? If we go to the next slide, uh, that should actually say Ephesians 5. Uh, I forgot to copy across the <laughs> reference. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We are the bride of Christ Jesus, that, that Christ gave himself up for in order that we could be holy. Wow. <laughs> Together, as the people of God, we are the ones that Jesus loves so much that he gave his life to die on a cross that we, the people of God, would be spotless before him as his bride. We talk so much about our own salvation, the fact that Jesus died for me and my sins, that I can have relationship with God. And that's not wrong. It's not a wrong kind of way to talk about our salvation. We have been saved as individuals. We have been saved uh, of our sins. But we also have to have this mindset that Jesus died for us, that we are his bride, God's people, and that he's made us a people for his own possession. That together, not individuals, it's not me and my relationship with Jesus. Uh, I'm, I'm a bride and, and he's a husband. It's we together, corporately, are a people for his own possessions. I love being a part of this church. I love being a part of this fellowship. I love that you guys are my brothers and sisters in Christ. It brings me so much joy. Uh, m- many of my kind of biological family live a long way away, but I've, I very much see this as my family. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, you are part of this family, and that excites me, and I'm so glad to be a part of it, as Tommy quite often sings. <laughs> um, and... and we sh- I showed a West Point highlights video uh, a couple of weeks back, two or three weeks back, um, and people shared about their highlights. Probably one of the main highlights for me of West Point was filming that video <laughs> and having people together like uh, Gareth and Neve or Duncan and George or Dave, Abe and Oakley. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a nice picture of uh, Dave <laughs> holding a mic there Oakley. Um, people who almost certainly would have no kind of association or connection with one another if it wasn't for the church. Quite happy happily sitting next to each other and being the body, being the church together. God has brought us together as a people, a community, a family, an army, and unless we think about our salvation in corporate terms, then we we miss something, we lose out massively. So how does being a part of the people of God change how I live? Uh, If we go to the next, next slide, we go to our second question. What should I do with my life? This is a question that's not just asked by uh, school children and students, though maybe they ask it more kind of immediately, what what am I going to do job-wise or the next few years? But it's a question that we often ask kind of throughout our lives. What what am I going to do with uh, with my future? I've lost track of the number of conversations I've had with uh, different people, the number of different people I've spoken to and prayed for, uh, looking for an answer to this question. And again, I I want to emphasize it's not a wrong question to ask, what am I going to do with, with my life? But I hope from what we've talked about already that it's, that it's clear that this question is insufficient, that it's lacking just in it itself. A few months back, Andy uh, was speaking to the X-Men, which is our kind of men's ministry at X1, about making big life decisions. Um, so where, where am I going to live? What job am I going to have? Uh, what town am I going to be part of, etc.? And at that time, there was particularly a number of men in the church who we knew that had, were in the process of making big life decisions. And, and that's something that kind of is ongoing. Um, but ask the question, which way are you facing when you make those decisions? Are you, are you facing God? 
Are you facing in the direction that you want to go <laughs> and then asking God to bless you as you go? If being a people comes about through being a part of Jesus' church and not through the job that I have or the place that I live or the salary that I earn or these other factors that, that often we kind of bear in mind when we're making those decisions. If, if being a people comes about through being a part of Jesus' church, then surely part of this question that we need to ask, what should I do with my life, should become, if we go to the next slide, God, where do I fit in your church? If our identity is together as the people of God, then what does that mean about how we're meant to live and to work together as his people? Um, if you've got your Bibles, this, this is a bit of a longer passage, so if you want to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, I'm actually reading from verse 4. I've got a couple of the verses up there, but I'm going to read from verse 4 to verse 31. Oh, yeah, sorry, 12, not 11. <laughs> now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the same Spirit. To another faith by, by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, would, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, the sense of hear, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Or the con on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, and that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. And goes on to talk about the way of love. We need each other. <laughs> I hope that's clear from the passage that we've just read. We need each other. To answer Paul's question at the end of this passage, are all teachers, uh, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, etc., etc.? The answer implied is no. <laughs> the whole point of this passage is that in order to be a fully functioning, healthy, working body together, we need one another. We can't be the church by ourselves, and we're not meant to try. 
again, sometimes when I speak to some Christians, it can feel like they're wanting to accumulate every single gift uh, and ability and skill so that they're able to be the church to everybody else, uh, like a one man or one woman church. That's not how we're meant to work. We're meant to need one another. We're meant to be lacking in certain areas, in certain giftings, in certain skills and abilities. And that's sometimes hard to hear, but we're meant to need one another. We're, I recognize in myself that there's lots of things that I'm not able to do that, that I, I lack. And I'm so grateful that there are others in the church who I know who are very gifted in those areas, uh, who complement and work together well for the purpose of this body. But again, it's... it's, it's um, it's good to know that we're not meant to be that one <laughs> kind of complete, perfect uh, person who has everything. Uh, we're meant to recognize giftings and abilities in one another and not say, I don't really need them because I can do that. We're meant to recognize that we do completely need one another. There is an interdependence as part of this church, and that's how God's designed it to be. This is part of why I got so upset about that couple doing church alone. Like the passage said, they're effectively saying to the rest of the body, I have no need of you. And in doing so, not only are they missing out on kind of the large majority of the rest of the body, uh, the bodily functions that they, uh, they don't have themselves, but they're also removing themselves from the body too. The fact is that we're all different, and we, we celebrated this a couple of weeks ago with our International Sunday. Um, we had a fantastic morning together. We're celebrating diversity, and, and as well as kind of the different gifts and abilities that were just lifted, listed uh, in that passage, we also just have different personalities, different backgrounds, different experiences, and all of that works together for the glory of God to, uh, to complement it, to, uh, to just yeah, build up this body together. We, the fact that we have those different experiences, that we can speak into different people's lives, uh, is a good thing. We all have a role to play, and it's good and right that our roles look different. We need each other. I've got an illustration. I wonder, Dave, can I borrow you for a second? If you come up. <laughs> um, I need to bring this table around, so I'm just going to make a little bit of space. If you help me bring this table across. So I want to just illustrate this point. I, I realize there's already a kind of a biblical illustration, thank you, for, um, for the body. Uh, but I thought I'd give us another illustration which hopefully will be memorable to you. This is cool. <laughs> it's a good start. I was just about to say this could get messy, um, judging by that. It's not unlikely. Uh, Dave, you want to bring those bags over as well? So, again, this is uh, a borrowed illustration, um, but one that hopefully will speak to you. I want us to imagine that each of us... I'm just going to test that this works. I can actually try it on it. <laughs> I'm hoping so. Uh, there we go. That's good. Uh, I want us to imagine that each of us are represented... You can sit down, thank you. Give a round of applause. <laughs> I might need to borrow you again in a second, Dave. <laughs> we'll see how we get on. Each of us is represented by uh, different types of foods. So uh, you may feel like you are uh, life-giving, sustaining apple juice, uh, which is refreshing, and you are a person who is refreshing to the rest of the body. Uh, and that's good. So we'll put, we'll put in some apple juice, because that, uh, that is a good thing to have. Um, you may, we'll get this ready for in a second, uh, you, may be, uh, you may be thinking that you're not terrifically exciting, but that you provide good sustenance, that you uh, encourage other people, and that um, you are, uh, again, kind of life-giving. So we've got some fruit and veg here, which um, actually fruit is quite exciting, I quite like it, but let's, let's put some fruit and vegetables in there too. Uh, you maybe you maybe feel like uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> this is really going to get messy. I'm quite enjoying myself, really. Um, <laughs> you may you may be somebody who uh, is able to kind of provide that that nourishment for others that keeps them going throughout the day. You know, speaking those words of life to others that keeps them going for the rest of the morning, like uh, like some good shreddies. Um, so let's put some shreddies in there because that, that is a good thing. 
um, you may be, you may be, <laughs> quite enjoying this. Uh, <laughs> you may be uh, somebody who is quite, quite sweet and uh, like bubbly, uh, and you just provide others with energy. And there's um, some nice, lovely Nutella, which just is delicious. Um, what's wrong with Nutella? Nutella's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe that you're good in the mornings, but not generally the rest of the time. In which case, you need some support of, you know, coffee. Like some people, some people are just really good at getting others up in the morning. Or, yeah, just helping out. So, uh, <laughs> I'm running out of illustrations. I didn't kind of go through all these. So I just imagine that these next few items are just, you know, you're, you, you may be an olive. You may think of yourself in that way. You know, and a quiet taste. Not everybody gets on with you, you know, but but actually, some people really love you. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, let's, put, let's put a couple of slices of meat in there as well. Um, it's, it's good. What? Ham, that's delicious, Lorraine. What are you talking about? Well, I don't have any more, Mike, but I do have the next best thing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I have a spoon in here somewhere. I think I've lost it. Uh, the chocolate, okay. Mm. I'll, use a, I'll use a knife. I'm not sure that uh, chocolate and bovril will go too well together in the same. <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, bovril, and, bovril and ham, that's great. A great combination, isn't it? Um, okay, uh, and then you know, I'll, I'll just finish off by putting in a couple of these lovely, delicious little mini rolls, because they, they, they're very nice as well. Everyone likes a mini roll, don't they? Okay, so this is the this is uh, the people. This is us, um, the the body, and I'm hoping this is going to work. <laughs> so I hold it down. I hold it down, Sue. Don't you worry. Is James Brown in the room? I hope not. <laughs> Might need somebody to go and uh, get some tissues in a minute. But like I was like we're meant to be everything we're meant to have all the different skills abilities giftings we're meant to be all the body together and let me uh oh. you can still hear me if i talk okay. we try and we try and conform to kind of one thing almost like the the christian uh, what christian looks like the christian kind of ideal um, so that's what I'm making now. I'm trying to make the Christian ideal, bringing this all together, making kind of the perfect Christian that we should all be, um, and see what it looks like. Uh, so, wow, that looks delicious. Okay. So here we are, the, the perfect Christian ideal, um, and uh, this, this has got kind of all the different parts that we need all in one, so that is... That smells so much worse than even I expected it to. <laughs> Dave, um, you still want to be a volunteer? <laughs> Let's not look from there. Yeah, that's pretty rank. <laughs> the purpose being, hopefully, <laughs> that was an amusing illustration, but it's serving a point that uh, we're not meant to just all kind of merge together. You don't come along on a Sunday morning so that we tell you this is how you're meant to be, this is how you're meant to act, this is what you're meant to look like, and we all sort of kind of conform to this one standard. That was really disgusting. I'm going to get some water. <laughs> We all conform to this uh, one um, kind of, yeah, this is what our Christian looks like. We're meant to. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. <laughs> we, are, we are meant to complement each other and actually look, hopefully, more like this next picture. It's a lovely three course meal. And we, we, we complement each other as the body, but we don't ignore the things that make us different. We work together well. We don't try and. Uh, conform and be everything by ourselves. 
That literally just tasted like sick. Uh, <laughs> 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 but together, <laughs> together we, you, you'll remember this anyway, won't you? <laughs> uh, together, we, we work together so that together we are the body. And yeah, don't, so I, I want to just encourage you, don't try and be everything by yourself. Don't try and conform. Celebrate the fact that we have differences in the church. Celebrate the fact that we have kind of different backgrounds, different skills. Uh, so many people like look at others and say, oh, I really wish that I had their, their gift of healing. I really wish I had their gift of prophecy. And, and as a little caveat, I'm not saying that we shouldn't desire spiritual gifts like the passage that we just read encouraged us to eagerly desire uh, spiritual gifts. But don't feel bad that you don't have a certain gift that somebody else has if God hasn't gifted you in that way. Don't feel bad that you don't have a certain personality type that you look at others and think, I really wish I was like that. God has made you who you are for a reason and God has made you a part of this church family for a reason. We're meant to be ourselves and who God has made us and we're together. And again, we're not just meant to be by ourselves. It's not like we say, okay, well, I'm not like that so I'm just going to go over here and be a potato by myself because that is a rubbish meal. Um, <laughs> we're meant to be together to be um, this people. So anyway, I'll move this out of the way and bring my lectern back and have a little bit more of Andy's juice. <laughs> Thank you. You probably don't want that back now, do you? Okay. <clears throat> um, again, at West Point, I'm sorry if you went out of West Point, I realise I've mentioned it sort of three times um, already. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, at West Point, at the end of the last kind of service, um, there was quite an amusing point at which, uh, I don't know how many people watch The Great British Bake Off, but um, there's a girl called Martha who was on last year's show. Uh, she's a Christian, she's part of a New Frontiers church, a Christian church, and uh, came along to West Point. Um, and we, uh, after the meeting, there was a group of us from X1, and um, we saw Martha was just a part of the group that was next to us. And she suddenly came over and sort of made a beeline for um, an X1 member. And, and we're like, oh, it's a bit strange. And she went over and talked to Harry. And Harry uh, Dinsdale, uh, I'll embarrass you, is he in here? No, oh, there you go, I can embarrass him even more. Um, had absolutely no idea who she was. <laughs> and just was like, oh, hello. Um, but she went over to Harry and thanked him because uh, a year earlier or two, well, probably two kind of Westmonts earlier, he um, had prayed for her and just felt strongly that God was going to use her gift of baking to bless others. Um, and Harry spoke that over her. <laughs> uh, and she had remembered it and it was significant to her. Um, and obviously then the following year went and uh, was on kind of national TV as, as a Christian doing baking. And has kind of since used that as, as an opportunity to um, do other things and get involved in other things as well. But that's just an example um, of a way in which uh, the body blesses one another. Harry had heard from God and used that gift to go and to bless her, and she had a gift of baking, which then she's used and uh, kind of has blessed millions and continues to do so. Um, so it was just quite a good little story. So our identity is corporate, and our understanding of what we do with our lives should also be corporate and interdependent. But surely it's still okay to ask the question, am I reaching my potential? <clears throat> In this last section, I really just want to repeat what I've already been saying, which is don't have too high a view of yourself as an individual, and don't have too small a view of the church as God's people. Uh, the next slide, Carl Truman says this, uh, the belief that we are special is, by and large, complete tosh. Most of us are mediocre, make unique contributions only in the peculiar ways we screw things up and could easily be replaced as a husband, father, or employee by somebody better suited to the task. Yet far too many Christians have senses of destiny that verge on the messianic. The confidence that the Lord has a special plan and purpose just for them shapes the way they act and move. Put bluntly, when I read the Bible, it seems to me that the church is the meaning of human history. But it is the church as a corporate body, not the distinct individuals who make up her membership. My special destiny as a believer is to be part of the church. And it is the church that is the big player in God's wider plan, not me. 
<clears throat> Hopefully that struck a nerve with a few people. <laughs> it's not necessarily the easiest thing to hear. Something in most of us wants to be grand and, and great, uh, wants to be the people who are seen to change the world. But the reality is that the world changes through lots of unseen actions and unnamed people. The role of brilliant leaders, genius uh, thinkers, taking on the world and changing it for the better is, is a popular one, but probably the role is a lot smaller than we actually think. The role of ordinary people who never appear on videos, never stand up on the stage, never get written about, but they work in their offices and they raise their families and they pay their taxes, is probably much greater than we think. We are called to be the people of God, God's people, and to change the world together. Don't have too high a view of yourself as an individual and don't have too small a view of God's people, the church. Another little kind of caveat, I, 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 I'm... I want you to, to make the most of your life. And, and a desire for spiritual maturity and increased gifting is a very good and right thing to pursue and to desire. But oftentimes we're asking ourselves the question, am I reaching my potential for the wrong reasons? What we're really asking is, have people recognized me yet? Have I made it? Am I a success? Instead, I would suggest that we consider asking the following question. Are we serving each other and our town as Christ intended? And this last passage from Philippians 2 has come up in this 4G series in all three of our sermons. And we didn't plan that. <laughs> it's just um, obviously a, a passage that is significant, clearly, for our church for this time. And it explains and summarizes far better than I could the importance of gathering as God's people and what it should look like. So let me read it to you. Philippians 2, 1 to 11 says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We worship and serve the one whose name is above every other name. The purpose of our lives is not to live for ourselves, to make a name for ourselves, but to make famous the name of Jesus Christ. He is the one who gave his life so that we can become the people of God this morning, that we can be a people. There are many people in Watford who are not a people who are living without hope. I want to be able to boast in this church, uh, in this gather people, in us as Christ First Watford and the, and the church in Watford, uh, that we work together to serve our town and to bring hope to our town. Just something that God, um, uh, again, has placed on my heart, just kind of a wording that God's placed on my heart recently um, that, that I just... I've been praying into and trying to express is I, I really feel it's right that we should desire and even kind of set as a goal that there be no one in Watford without hope. Which means reaching the lonely, healing the broken, serving the poor, sharing the gospel. 
but we can't do this as random individuals <laughs> just going off and uh, we've talked before about personal evangelism and, and again I don't want to kind of downplay that but this is a mission that we are on board with together we are the people of God together and God has placed you in X1 for this season for a reason so I just wanted to leave this fun, final encouragement it just says be the body serve the body give hope to this town I want to just give you a couple of challenges to finish and then I want to pray for us. Um, Andy's talked already uh, about the prayer meeting on Sunday and, I, and I'll admit as well that I was, I was disheartened by kind of the, the low turnout for our prayer meeting because having just talked about the body and the fact that we need one another, the fact is that the people that were there were maybe... Uh, uh, an arm and a piece of hair and a toe, but we were missing the vast majority of the body. Um, and we need the body there to pray with us. We, we, uh, we, we called all of us to be involved in praying and to be involved in uh, serving the poor. And, and again, X1 Active um, met on Saturday morning. And again, I think it was just a handful of individuals. But even over you know, the last few months, it's the same people that are getting involved in this. But we need the whole body to be involved in serving the rest of the body, in praying, and in serving our town. And it may be that you think that you don't have anything to offer. It may be that you are sitting thinking, I, I don't even feel like I'm a toenail. You know, I, don't feel like, I don't feel like I can offer anything to this church. I, I want to I just come against that in Jesus' name and say, you have a significant role to play as part of this body. You may not know what it is. You may need to speak to others and, and uh, to just ask people that you trust. You know, what do you think my giftings are? Where do you think I can fit? Where do you think I can serve and get involved? But I want to encourage you, if you're not yet involved, if you're not yet serving this body in any way, you have something to offer and you are here for a reason and you should serve this body. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you, if you are have a tendency to be on the other end of the scale and be thinking, I don't really have a need for the rest of the body. <laughs> I kind of can do this Christian thing by myself. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good and I'm pretty kind of okay by myself. I, I want to say that's, that's a wrong attitude to have. <laughs> you may be kind of okay in, in kind of living independently and you know, doing your own thing. But aside from the fact that you do need other people, they also need you. They need your support. They need your care. We have people in this church who are less physically able, maybe less um, educationally able, or, or whatever. We, there are many, many, many needs within this church and within our town that you should be serving as part of this people. And I want to encourage you to do that.